respond to the oration, uh, which is in the memory of uh, Ms. Geeta Ramesh Chandra Gandhi. Uh, it gives me great pleasure to introduce our esteemed chairpersons, uh, Dr. Purish Parik, Senior Medical Oncologist from Mumbai, and Dr. Hemant Malatra, Senior Medical Oncologist from Jaipur. Thank you. Already on WhatsApp groups, we've received so many congratulatory notes and uh, thanking Vijay Patil. Uh, so instead of wasting time, may I please invite Vijay to start the oration. He's professor of medical oncology at Tata Memorial Hospital. And we've actually seen him grow from strength to strength right before our eyes. So it's a real pleasure to eagerly await your oration, Vijay. Thank you organizers for the opportunity. And uh, when I was given this uh, topic, I decided what, what would I be speaking about. Then I decided that uh, I would speak on Indian advances in head and neck and CNS tumors which have happened over the years. Now, I think that in any profession, it is your mentor who guides you. And in this situation, my mentor was Dr. Kumar Prabhas, sir. I was his first thesis student. And from there, we had this journey of doing research together. And many questions which we answered were well in an Indian context. Along with that, we had a great lady standing behind us. And as we say that uh, the success belongs to the lady. And Dr. Vanita was always there to guide us. Along with that, we had Dr. Amit Joshi, sir, who was also there as a part of the team and used to make us calm whenever things didn't go according to the practice. Three stories I have chosen for today's oration. The first story is of borderline and resectable head and neck cancers. The second will be the development and integration of metronomic chemotherapy uh, in the, as a standard of care. And the third would be development of CNS medical oncology in Tata Memorial Hospital. And let me start with borderline and resectable head and neck cancer. This were the type of cancers we used to see in head and neck cancer opens daily, day in and day out. We used to give neoadjuvant chemotherapy to these patients. However, whenever you talk on forum, this was heavily debated, okay, that you can't give neoadjuvant chemotherapy, you need to do surgery in these patients. And that was the time we decided, no, if we are going to do this, this needs to be done more systematically. And at that time, we decided we'll start making criteria for calling what is borderline resectable. And thus evolved, not criteria were given before that, but Alderstein and Dr. Pradhan, but they were very subject to criteria. And we, after that, developed the objective criteria for calling what we would call as a borderline resectable head and neck cancer. A buccal mucosa cancer, which is going above the peri having edema above the zygoma, or a tunk malignancy, which will have growth very near to the vallecula, so that your hyoid needs to get resected. The issue was, when you had such extensive tumor, either you can't have a margin negative resection, or you cannot have functional resections in these patients. And many of the surgeons would actually operate on such kind of patients. After that, we published a flow of modern and resectable head and neck cancer. All of these cancers used to get discussed in multidisciplinary clinic. We used to give two cycles of neoadjuvant chemotherapy. After two cycles, we would take them back to the multidisciplinary clinic decide based on the response and PS, whether we would continue with a radical intent or we go with palliative intent. What did this we achieve with this? What we achieved was those patients who underwent surgical treatment, they had a two-year progression, a two-year overall survival of 47%. And let's keep that figure in mind, a two-year overall survival of 47%. Better, those who got operated, and if they received adjuvant therapy further, this survival was more better in the, this group of patients. And let me put this in perspective for many. Why is this two years of well of 47 or 50 percent so important? And this is the data of OCAT study, a 900 patient study who were upfront operable, who had T3, T4, or N2, N3 tumors. Look at the median survivals. The median survivals here are 18 months. And now when you go back and look at the median survivals of a T4B or a heavily node positive who were considered unresectable after neurogenic chemotherapy, when you give this kind of outcomes, this are truly uh, promising. Now a lot of things went again. Ours was a pragmatic uh, group. 
not every patient could uh, receive TPF. There were logistic issues in giving TPF. We used to follow this algorithm kind of a looking at the logistics about what would be the cost involved, what would be the comorbidities involved, what will, how fit the patient is, and it would be a practical aspect whether you do three weekly uh, a DCF or you could go, go for a uh, two weekly, uh, two drug, uh, three weekly regimen or even a weekly regimen. The question was, are you justified in giving a two drug regimen when you had a three drug regimen? Most of the time, logistics actually dictated that the two drug regimen was given. We did this retrospective analysis in which about 245 patients, Dr. Vanita is the lead author in this, compared whether a three drug regimen is as good as two drug regimen or not. The answer was clear, the three drug regimen was better than the two drug regimen. But there were certain questions. Most of the three drug regimens were given in, in a private setup in the patients who had better build up, better, better nutrition. Most of the two drugs given were, were given in a general, a general OPD setup. The issue was, yeah, was we could prove this in a prospective study. We actually, this got overshadowed by the low-dose immunotherapy and the docetaxel presentation. This was presented this ASCO by my colleague, Dr. Ajay Singh. This was a study of 496 patients. The first study of borderline resectable head and neck cancer. Half of them got randomized to DC, half of them got randomized to DCF. And these are the mature results, and this is manuscript is in preparation. And you could see in these long-term results, it's clear that there is an advantage of giving three drug regimen over a two drug regimen in a randomized comparison. So DCF still holds betterment with respect to progression free survival and with respect to overall survival. Did it come at the cost of toxicity? Yes, it did come at the cost of toxicity with grade three and four adverse events happening in nearly 70% of patients with DCF as opposed to nearly 40 to 50% of patients in the DC regimen. Most of the work which I have done and which I will be showing was not done by me alone. A dedicated group of residents used to work with me in our unit, it's a policy that our residents are involved when the trial is running. They need to know about what the protocol is, how the regimens have to be administered, so that when they go in the society, if this becomes the standard of care, they could be easily integrated this. These are the dedicated group of residents who worked on this, uh, on this project. And Ajay, uh, Ajay, the pic large picture, he actually presented these results at ASCO this year. There was one problem we used to face, and many of you who are in, uh, in this hall have worked in Tata, that a lot of patients of a 5U used to, uh, used to have diarrhea. And this work, this was a discussion with one of our students, Dr. Saurabh uh, Zanwar, who is now in Mayo Clinic, that why these patients are developing diarrhea. So what we did is, those patients in whom there was severe mucositis or diarrhea, we actually started sending the DYPD mutations. What we saw was most of them, nearly out of this two, 11 of them actually had DYPD mutation. We had a problem. DYPD mutation at that time, we used to get it done from outside and used to cost some 10 to 13,000 of rupees depending on the lab which month. And it was not feasible for us to do DYPD in all patients with this cost of DYPD. And then stepped in Dr. Anuradha Chaugule, madam, who which she developed, an, uh, she developed a protocol for doing DYPD in our lab itself and it cost only 3,000 uh, 3, rupees to the patients. We subsequently did it for 118 consecutive head and neck cancer patients and we did show that around 24% of our patients had this DYPD mutation and largely this was in exon 13 where A gets replaced with a guanin and that's the picture of Dr. Anuradha. We didn't stop it here, we continued. We continued to take this project for 1,000 plus patients and after 1,000 plus patients also it is in the, it was seen that nearly 28% of our patients had DYPD mutation. This database now is up about 5,000 patients and this soon will get published. Now, another thing we realized is that giving TPF was a tough job. So we wanted to know how can we deliver TPF safely. At that, we actually saw that when we give TPF in India, and this is in comparison with all international studies, we get a lot more amount of febrile neutropenia, a lot more of hyponatremia, which was not reported, a lot more about mucositis. If Dr. Vamshi and Dr. Bharat, oh, at their time TPF started with a year, they could have told us that patients used to land up in casualty with seizures because of hyponatremia. And then we had to decide, okay, how do we deliver this safely? And this work was done by this pharmacy student of ours, uh, uh, Nilambari Savadekar. What we did was for 50, 55 patients, daily toxicity monitoring was done. We actually did counts daily, we actually did electrolytes daily, and we wanted to see which was the day when the ANC fault, which was the day when uh, the uh, potassium would fall, which was the day when sodium would fall. The idea was, can we predict that all these toxicities would happen in some defined time interval 
And if you admit the patient in for the, that defined time interval, you could actually manage this toxicity in indoors and you could say that okay if the patient is admitted for 10 days okay 90 percent of this toxicity would happen in that time and the patient can be safely discharged after that and we actually saw that if you look carefully most of the toxicities would happen within 10 to 12 days and if you admit the patient for 10 to 12 days and manage this toxicity well see management of toxicity is not a problem as medical oncologists we manage toxicity of aml we manage toxicity of ex uh, escalated b -cop. the problem was we used to discharge the patient and when the patient used to come and they used to come late and that was the pro that was actually the problem what this study actually showed that if you keep the patient admitted for 10 to 12 days it's very safe to deliver the TPF. I could proudly tell that our mortality with TPF in Tata Memorial Hospital is 1.5%. If you compare that with other hospitals in US, in real world setting, you could see in this paper it is 14.3%. So this is not a regimen which should be taken lightly and needs to be given under proper care. Now, TPF requires logistic, requires PICC, requires you to do, deliver a lot amount of efforts in that. Can we have an alternative regimen? And here is uh, Dr. Lakhan Kashyap, and this work was actually started at the time of COVID. Many of our beds actually went for COVID. At that time, we came up with this. We have a metronomic chemotherapy. We had weekly paclitaxel carboplatin. Why not make a metronomic schedule of weekly paclitaxel carbo and triple metrim, so a five-drug regimen for giving chemotherapy. And to our surprise, when we gave that to our first 14 patients, you could see in the water flow that most of the patients, there was a decrease in the size of the tumor, which could see, and you could see that in the scans and the photo of the patient. This actually was published by Lakhan in e-cancer. E and we could actually good overall survival in these patients, and this at a very, uh, what I would say, acceptable toxicity profile. And actually, I would need to thank Dr. Gunjesh who is sitting in the audience. He actually got posted in Tata Muzaffarpur at that time. And this was used in Tata Muzaffarpur as the standard regimen for delivering new adjunct chemotherapy. And these results were replicated by him that, and was presented by him in the ASCO of 2022. We actually in Tata kept going up. And we now have a database of 72. And this was again presented by uh, one of our students. And this was by actually work was done by Shruti and uh, Zoya of data collection for this, uh, for this project, in which we saw that this regimen could be delivered safely. It, it was efficacious. And it, the, the results could re get, get recapitulated in 72 patients. At present, this database stands at around 130 patients. The question is, can it replace the standard TPF regimen? And that is the question of our next phase three study, in which we are come going to compare TPF as the standard arm versus this re metronomic regimen of paclitaxel carboplatin with three drugs as And this would be uh, the thesis topic of my current student, Dr. Uh, Rumeli Roy. Now, let's talk about response. You gave, gave chemotherapy. The problem is, you would have seen this multiple times. There's a good shrinkage of the tumor, which is seen visually. Unfortunately, when you see it at radiology, the radiological response system comes at stable disease or it doesn't come as appreciable as it's seen with what is seen in uh, clinical practice. And this is what we actually realize. Our surgeons used to say, oh, there is a good photographic decrease, but radiologically it's not uh, that great. Should we operate or not operate? So hence to answer this question, we actually take, took 23 patients who had developed near pathological CR. We went back and saw what did the radiologist reported. We also went back and saw what did the, the patient's perception was that. And this work was uh, uh, done in, uh, done and I was helped in this work by Dr. Vamshi and Dr. Bharat actually. And the radiological assessments were done by Dr. Sashikan Zuekar. He was the backbone of all our NACT studies in which he used to do response assessment for all of us. And this is what you could see that even in patients who had pathological near CR, you could see that not all patients had a very good uh, partial response. Not all patients had a CR. There were, in some patients, actually, there was suggested that there was an increase in the size of the tumor. And there was very limited correlation between what was the pathological response and the radiological response. But if you ask the patient, did your tumor decrease? And that actually was very in concordance with that, they felt that 80 to 90 percent that the tumor had decreased. And that's the reason why we decided that henceforward after this study, we would be taking radio, the phot clinical photographs of all these patients before the NACT and after the NACT. And this is just an example how a good clearance can be there on clinical photographs itself, but the radiology may not be in line. After this, our discussion with our group of surgeons, if there is a clinical response, they are more than happy to operate these patients because they also do well. And but the question is, 
why does this happen in with resist where you would have good object to uh, subject to response but not a good object to response that is because this is the way resist gets calculated if your tumor is a cylinder or a sphere a decrease in dimension is good but if your tumor is irregular as is the case in head and neck cancer you don't actually go back and look at the same dimension you look at the longest dimension which may or may not be the same dimension and sometimes there is not a centripetal uh, uh, shrinkage of the tumor there is a differential shrinkage of the tumor because of which this was seen and this was also seen in this study in which we showed that no you need to have not only radiological response assessment but clinical response assessment and you need to take into uh, mind what the patient is saying so now we are given near urgent chemotherapy we have seen that there is a response let's do surgery for this patients and the question is whether when you do surgery in this patients whether you can achieve margin negative resections because that was the question with which we started with if this patient responds at at least at tata the margin positive status is less than 1% and the close margin status is only 2.96% now let the question is how would this get compared if you looked at T4A or T4B which got operated up front and which were considered resectable and this work was done by Colonel Sahu unfortunately I didn't have his photo and uh, this is a comparison of 400 patients 215 in who underwent up front surgery 215 who underwent near uh, uh, chemo and then surgery you could see that for all parameters close margins uh, positive margins there was no much difference in, and in fact the results were in more in favor of giving neurogen chemotherapy followed by surgery just to make the point that when you operate after neurogen chemotherapy you can achieve negative margins you can achieve the poor prognostic factors actually go down what about the complications which happen after neurogen chemotherapy surgery was done this work was done by me in, in work with uh, dr shantam chakravarti with malabal cancer center in which we actually looked at what were the compli post operative complication rates in patients who have undergone upfront surgery versus near gen followed by surgery there is a minimal increase in certain local regional complications which is seen in this uh, in this situation okay near gen chemo given response is there you underwent surgery the question is what do you select do you give radiation do you give chemo radiation or if you want to give chemo radiation what do you select the issue is you cannot operate to the pre NACT margins. If you could have operated to the pre-NACT margins, you could have operated the patient up front. You normally operate according to the post-NACT margin. So you are not very sure whether the margins which, which are there, which are looking sterilized at pathology are actually, were they positive at that time. So at Tata, our policy is to give CTRT in these patients. Most of the time we select cisplatin in such situation, but we need to be careful about selection of cisplatin. As the cumulative dose of cisplatin increases, you must have, would have given 150 to 225 milligram per meter square of cisplatin in the near gen setting. When you give more amount of cisplatin in the concurrent setting, you could see this in this study, that the steady rise in uh, uh, creatinine which would happen in this patient and they may develop metabolic syndromes. There's an interesting question and this was actually presented in uh, ASCO by Sudeep and uh, Somnath, where let's say that let's take a situation, patient gets operated. One situation, there is a pathological CR in the node and the tumor. Second situation, pathological CR either in the node or in the tumor. And third, there is no pathological CR. Can you get away without doing CTRT in these patients who have a pathological CR uh, in, the, in the group one? First thing what we found, those who developed pathological CR, they had a great uh, uh, outcomes. Second, interestingly we saw that even if the patient had a pathological CR in the tumor and in the node, they did benefit with the addition of concurrent chemotherapy along with radiation and this was seen and this was a pretty uh, large study of around 100 plus patients with around 50-50 patients that have been in each group. We are going to give so much amount of chemo to these patients in neurogen setting, we are going to give chemo during the CTRT. You need to be bothered about the metabolic syndromes which would develop in these patients in their follow-ups. And that is one of the things which I would say that if the patient has received neurogen chemotherapy, then has received CTRT, you need to look at the metabolic syndromes. And, and quite a few of these patients actually develop impaired glucose tolerance over, over a period of time. Now, what has been the impact of this development? This, we have actually published, I have shown you a snapshot of few studies, around 35 to 40 studies in the space of polar and resectable head and neck cancers. Did this made an impact? Only one randomized study, actually, rest of the data is retrospective, but of good quality. 
We found that and we actually did that th there was a good adoption of this technique in South India, North Central India, sub Himalayan region, Western India, and even in Eastern India, and these are the references. Actually, we were surprised that this actually uh, came as, as a paradigm shift in few of the articles. And this was a very pleasant surprise to me. Dr. Vamakan, those who know, follow head and neck oncology would know he's the first author of extreme study and a renowned authority. A recent textbook in Springer, he actually has a devoted a chapter on this, on border and resectable and technically unresected head and neck cancer. We, we argues that you need to be giving neogen chemotherapy and then, pros then um, a following of this patient in accordance with the response. Again, a pleasant surprise when the resource constraint guidelines for, from the ASCO was written by Fagan. It actually did show, they actually had a, put it in center that there is something called technically unresectable and induction chemotherapy giving in this, this setting is one of the valid option in this setting. This was about border and uh, head and neck uh, cancers. Do we have some high impact work which has come from Tata in the NACT setting? Absolutely, yes. Mandular preservation trial. Up till now, organ preservation in head and neck cancer meant preservation of the larynx, larynx, and larynx. We never talked about preservation of mandible, which was important for cosmosis purpose. It's important for swallowing. It's important for mastication in the setting. And this is one of the first study, taking a clue from Lisa Lissitros studies, where you operate on the post NACT volumes, you could spare mandibles. And this was an interesting study. We, we, we completed a study actually in 2014 and 15, and now for a long period of time we didn't publish it because we were waiting for the data to get matured. And Dr. Shiva and me actually had the privilege of doing the data entry and writing the first draft of the study. And we saw that over eight years there is no difference whether you operate upfront or you give neogen, chemotherapy, and spell than mandibles. Question is how many mandibles we could spare? It is 66% of the mandibles got spared in this setting. And there is good data now which goes up to eight years where you could see that the curves are just intermingling and there is no, uh, no bad impact of you near joint and doing mandibular spelling. Another thing which actually gets quoted in NCC in a lot for giving cisplatin etoposide in Kaddish. C and D stage for vestigial neuroblastoma. This was a small study, but we had the initial results coming for two years. Now the results have gone for up to six years. And Dr. Vibhor and Dr. Saurabh had worked hard on this database to maintain this database. Another few, few interesting studies which came, one was for giving induction chemotherapy in maxillary sinus. Induction chemotherapy in patients who are likely to under have strider. So when you talk about organ preservation larynx, if the patient suddenly has a strider, you need to do tracheostomy. You do a tracheostomy and then after that, preserving that organ is difficult. We actually explored whether giving induction chemotherapy, it, it was a very vigorous protocol, of course. Can it be delivered? And yes, in 70% of the patients, we could avoid tracheostomy and also preserve their mandible in, uh, in long term. This, this work largely was done by Dr. Bhavesh and Dr. Bharat Sohan. With that, I'll stop on the story of neogen chemotherapy. I'll take on to another favorite topic of mine, head and neck cancer, palliative therapy. The issue was, this is one of the commonest tumors in India. If you see at Globocon, because oral cancer, lip, larynx, hypopharynx get divided differentially, it doesn't come up. But if you collate that head and neck is one of the commonest tumors in India. Unfortunately, 85 to 90% will be coming in locally advanced stage, and most of them relapse. Accessibility and affordability is an issue. Unfortunately, this disease is seen in patients who have come from low social administrator, and they even don't want to waste one day of their life to come to the hospital because that means they lose their daily wages. And this exactly was the situation uh, uh, when we started working on this topic. We actually saw whether how many of them could uh, uh, have uh, received immunotherapy. And this data was presented by Dr. Ravi. And this initial work actually was started by Dr. George Abraham. And we saw that very few amount of our patients could actually afford immunotherapy. So what, what would you do? Before we started that, we actually wanted to know what is the expectation of the patients? What does the patient want when he wants to undergo palliative chemotherapy? Does the patient want to live longer? Does he want to have symptom control or he wants to have both? Whether he is okay to lose his life for some amount of most time which we wanted to go at home. And a lot of people, Chandrakant, Asha, Vikas, Anand, Siddharth, and Arun were a part of this study. And this is the one, the first study, and probably the only study, in which patients have been asked after, after counseling, what you actually want from your, uh, from your treatment. Interestingly, 75% of the patients, in spite of the poor prognosis been explained, wanted an increment in lifespan. 
Obviously, they also wanted symptom control, but that wasn't glaring. We actually thought that many of the patients would opt only for, uh, in, uh, in, uh, opt only for symptom control. Another slide which I've not shown is most of these patients, 90% of these patients wanted 80% or more of their time to be spent at home, which means they don't want to visit in the last few days to the hospital. They wanted this. And this is actually goes with the Chris Broth concept which came in GCO a few months back, that time toxicity where the time which is spent at hospitals, which is spent at doing investigation, is time away from their loved ones, and that should not be included in progression fee survival. He argues in that way, and that actually is a valid argument. And the whole story of metronomic actually doesn't start from Tata Hospital. The whole story of metronomic starts from Delvan, which is a place in coastal in, uh, co in the Konkan region, and it starts from this person who is a teacher to all of us, Dr. Shilpad Banauli. We just followed what Sir told. The original concepts of metronomic and the development of metronomic was completely done by Banauli, Sir. The time was in 2010 when we used to visit Derva. We used to see that patients who have been giving Selecoxib and Mithotex, they used to do well. We actually wanted to do a randomized study, and this was given by Dr. Kumar to me as my thesis topic. The problem was there was not a single data set for me to do a sample size collection of how much metronomic used to benefit. So I actually did in this OPD, this first 18 patients, and this was the first ever data of metronomic which got published, which actually showed us that this is promising. But the data of 18 patients, when I took it to the statistician, he told me hey, this is not compelling enough to do some, some sample size calculation. So I expanded that data to 64 patients and saw that Yes, it had some merit in testing further. And thus, this was the thesis topic for my DM which was given to me to do a randomized study of cisplatin single agent versus metronomic chemotherapy. And what we wanted to know is how would metronomic fear, uh, do in front of uh, cisplatin? To our surprise, both the PFS and the oral survival were improved by metronomic chemotherapy. We got really excited with this and when I'm joined back as consultant uh, in Tata Memorial Hospital in 2015, we decided it's this time we need to decisively prove whether metronomic works or it doesn't work. And we actually planned a large phase three study of comparing this uh, two regimens of metronomic versus cisplatin with the gold standard endpoint of overall survival. Now, there was an improvement in overall survival which was seen in the study. And apart from the extreme regimen and the keynote 048 regimen. This is the only third regimen over the last 30 decades which actually has shown that it can improve survival over uh, chemotherapy. It also improved quality of life. But its impact was larger than this. If you could see the side effect rates, it was less than 20%. If you could see the cost, it was actually a minuscule of cost what would be cost by cetuximab or pamrolizumab. Obviously, after this results came, we started doing metronomic right, left, and center. We started giving metronomic even in early failures in platinum refractory, a two drug metronomic. We failed miserably. The median survival with double metronomic in this situation was only 110 days. And this uh, work was largely done by Dr. Rakesh Pinati. And it was at that time when also, with a phase two study, I had visited ASCO, and one of the Scandinavian lady actually bashed me right, left, and center that if you want to develop metronomic chemo, there needs to be a model. How do you say that this is metronomic? How do you know what the dose is metronomic? What is the biomarker for metronomic? How does it act? What is the resistance mechanism? And that actually had a large impact on my mind that, okay, this, what the lady said was true. I was appreciated by most of them, but those negative criticisms were important. At that time, I used to work in Malabar Cancer Center, and I came across this very intelligent statistician. Unfortunately, we cannot re couldn't retain at Malabar, neither we could retain at Tata. He's at Oxford at present, and uh, Dr. Atanu Bhattacharji. I told him this problem that all phase one studies will have incre increasing the dose to look at maximum tolerable dose. What I want is the dose of metronomics is somewhere between one third to one tenth of the maximum tolerable dose. How do I get, get, get to this dose? We did a quite a bit of reading. We contacted Dr. Rakesh Chen and uh, Eddie Pasquier. And what came across was circulating endothelial cells and circulating endothelial progenitor cells could be very good biomarkers for causing the metronomic activity of this. And thus was born the first statistical model to define whether a drug would have a metronomic action 
And second, if it has a metronomic action, what is the dose at which it would have the best metronomic action? And that was what we defined as an optimal biological dose. It took us a year and a half to make this model, validate this model, and get this published in a statistical journal, because without a peer review validation, you cannot use a model in clinic. What we did after that was we actually planned the first phase one and phase two study of joining Arlotinib, Methotrexate, and Selecoxib in platinum refractory and early failure. This was a huge effort. I'll tell you why. This study had a phase one, and up till now, no one had done pharmacokinetics for this. So we, uh, I need to thank Dr. Vikram Gota. We did the pharmacokinetic analysis of all patients who were in phase one, looking at Methotrexate and Selecoxib levels, how the half-lives differ, how their destruction does happen. The second was we had to measure circulating endothelial cells, and this measurement circulating endothelial cells was done at baseline, at day eight, day 30, and every month. The problem is circulating endothelial cells are very fragile. You need to take the sample processing needs to happen around four to six hours. So we had to have a systematic plan how the sample would travel from TMH Paril to Khargar, where the lab was situated, which itself is 60 kilometers apart, and this processing started within four to six hours. And then I need to thank the people from the lab. There was a person who used to sample just five minutes before the vehicle left. The vehicle, it used to go with uh, all uh, temperature measures been kept. It used to be collected with the time input, whether it can be used or not, and used to be processed at that, at that day, and we would get the results by the evening. And this whole work was done by Dr. Manish, who was here, the builder guy, who now is in Germany and doing his, uh, pursuing his higher studies there. At the same time, there was another question which came was, many of the head and neck cancers cannot swallow. Now, we used to give them crushed tablets. Whether whole tablet versus crushed tablet, you would get the same levels in the blood or not was an interesting question, and that was actually answered by Dr. Manjunath. And this was the model, which was based on response rates and a decrement in, uh, uh, decrement in circulating endothelial cells and progen endothelial cells, which we had used in this to define which would be the best dose of metronomic chemotherapy. We were surprised. We were dealing with platinum refractory head and neck cancers. The response rate is 5% when you use chemotherapy. If you use cetuximab, it is around the 5 to 10%. If you use nivolumab, the response rate is 15%. We started seeing responses from the first patient itself, and we got a response rates of nearly 43% of the patient in this setting. And this were quite beautiful responses. You could see that this is a waterfall plot. But there was a problem. What I've shown below is the duration of response. If you look at the duration of response, they were short-lived. People used to have response, but this response used to die within four months. We got respectable PFS and OS, which was similar to what was seen with immunotherapy, but we were not happy. We were with the, oh, there is a response, but the response never used to last. We needed to have a method to see that the response to triple metronomic chemotherapy needed to last. We did quite a bit of literature search, and the answer which came was immunotherapy would be that would, would help us to make this response durable. The problem was, if I added to triple metronomic chemotherapy, full dose of immunotherapy, this would have, the cost would have got such exceeding that this would have defeated the purpose of development of metronomic. So the challenge was, how could we have a sustainable response but uh, come down on the Cost. At that time, this brilliant research came to a help, where we saw that the saturation of pd one receptor used to happen at 0.3 milligram per kg itself, and probably giving further doses may not be required. And hence, we planned this study in which one arm received triple metronomic chemotherapy, which was the standard for Tata Memorial Hospital, the another arm received triple metronomic chemotherapy with IV neulum of 20 mg. The dose of 20 was selected because for a 60 kg, Using 0.3 milligram per kg, a dose of 18 mg was required. And another there was a logistic issue here. The vial is to come of 40 mg, so we needed to split the vial because the budget also was limited for the study. The, in fact, the budget for the study was sponsored by one of our patients of lung cancer, or else the study wouldn't have been possible. Did we have some clues? And this data was from Dr. Amit uh, Kumar. I'm not sure whether he's in the audience. In fact, we had given this as compassionate ground in the OPD. And we had seen that, yes, low doses actually did well. Another data, which for reasons beyond my understanding is not getting published, published is 
the PDL1 expression, this is the 500 patient data, which shows that most of our patients, 89% have high PDL1 expression. And taking these clues, we said, no, we would do the study. And to our surprise, the response rates were increased with the addition of neolumab. The depth of response was increased. It led to an improvement in progression-free survival. It also led to an improvement in overall survival. It also improved the duration of response to nine to 10 months, which is what we were targeting in this. And importantly, it brought down the cost. The cost came down by 90% when we used this regimen. This work wouldn't have been possible with, without the, those dedicated three ladies who are standing there. Gunjesh was a part of this work. He knew how fast this recruitment was done because we were afraid that if we don't have two patients at one time to split the vial, we would. And so actually we recruited in five to six months this study and he was in the OPD at that time. Dr. Sachin Dumar, I'll, I have dedicated a slide. He is central to all studies which I have done in head and neck cancer. And the guy who was holding a baby is uh, Dr. Rahul Ravind. This was a thesis of this student and he was my first DM student. This was where Dr. Hemant was there when we were discussing about if IO response. This was one of the patients in this study and you could see that this was progression on DCF. This was such a brilliant response seen in a few months that we actually got our surgeons convinced to operate. The patient's PDL1 was 80 to 90 percent. It was a near pathological response. You can't, you need more validation of this data. Low dose nivolumab works well with metronomic chemotherapy. Can it work alone? That's a question, and that is a question we are answering in a study called Delhi, that is development of low dose immunotherapy in India. It's a big study of 800 patients. Dr. Kumar, Dr. Sudeep, and Dr. Badwe are joined to the PI of this study, and we are running this study. We are nearly completed 40% of this, of this, and this will give answer. But the pudding is, if these results get replicated across multiple centers. And here I need to thank my friend, Dr. Ashe, who developed few friends, and they started having a joint study. And I'm showing you the pictures of the, of the, of the people who are the highest recruiters in the study. 90% of the study is recruited. It is triple metronomic versus physician choice, physician choice even has immunotherapy if they can afford. And if everything goes according to plan, I think you would see Rusha Bharat Suri present in this data in ESMO, 2023. Other ideas which we had was why not think about joining Pakli Carbo with triple metronomic chemotherapy. Fantastic study. This got approved in 2018 and I'm still awaiting funding for the study to start. Thankfully, one of my colleagues, Dr. Akhil Kapoor, has got this approved as standard arms in uh, Varanasi and we will be starting this study uh, from Varanasi. Quite a bit of time when you used to give pamidolizumab in those affording patients, the question was, do we need to give cisplatin 5 or you could give paclitaxel carboplatin? This was the data which was actually done by Mithali, who is an MSc research student of giving pamidolizumab plus paclitaxel and carboplatin, which we published in the small study. But the thing was, this actually gave you confidence that this could be given in head and neck cancer. In this ESMO, we saw a large data coming up. Understand that early palliative care is key. We had data from Tamil in lung. We never had data from India in head and neck cancer specifically. This was the first global study of looking at whether early palliative care helps in head and neck cancers or not. And the two people since photos I have shown, one is Dr. Pankaj Singhanya. He was a student from palliative care. He's now a physician in Manipal. Brilliant work was done by, by, by this guy. Another was an observer with me uh, who was now in Mayo Clinic. Her name was Anuja Abhankar who worked hard on this study. Another thing we saw was a lot of patients used to have distress. If you sent to a psycho-oncologist, there was only one in Tata and he used to give a date after four weeks or five weeks. By that time, the patient would go in complete distress. And we decided that if we could remove some time out and do a stratified counseling on these patients, they could, whether this distort could get resolved or not. We actually could resolve distress of around 70% of the patients. Uh, this work was done by multiple people. I've shown the photo of Nikhil because up till now I've not got a chance to show the photo of Nikhil. Now metronomic chemotherapy did wonders for us. The question was, could metronomic do the same wonders when given in adjuvant in a curative setting? We were very aggressive. We launched four studies. One was radical and Hellenic cancer, salvage surgery done, not fit for uh, radiation, metronomic versus observation. 
The second was radical CTRT, CR, observation versus A. That was a thousand patient study. This one study, oral cancers, complete treatment has been done, randomization between observation versus OMCT. And one the famous NACT CT study by Dr. Pai, which has just finished recruitment. Unfortunately, the RMAX study, and I alluded to in this moderation in adrenal cancer, a lot of work was done by Dilip and Sujay in this study, actually showed negative results with this. In fact, May CTRT, this is in review at present, and this was again presented at ASCO this year in the review in a Lancet uh, group of journal, and actually showed similar results that metronomic in adjuvant setting is not doing well. And Few of the people who worked on this were Devanshi, Divya, and Nandini a lot. And I need to thank Dr. Sarbani. I am not showing you the data of CTRT. There's a lot to show in CTRT, but constraint of time, I've decided that the next topic, uh, which I'll be speaking on is CNS, because we never have shown our CNS work at any forum. Dr. Sarbani has been, with a very rarely you get such good colleagues who would help you out in all your studies, recruit them, give dates for radiotherapy. And without her help, we couldn't have done many of the CTRT studies. In 2015, when I joined TATAM, I was given a job to develop neuromedical oncology uh, in TATAM. And uh, the, one of the first thing I decided was I would replicate the model of head and neck cancer. So there's relapsed glioma, recurrent glioma. Let's see what they want. Interestingly, when we saw both, this was different from head and neck cancer. They wanted both. They wanted symptom control also, and they wanted prolongation of life also. And improvement in lifespan was a, a thing which was wanted by 90% of this patient. A largely work was done on this study by Dr. Vijay Sinha. We after that actually done a, did a 600 plus patient analysis of pattern of care of relapsed glioma. And this was, uh, this is in review in a journal at present, it was presented by Nandini in the KSMO conference. Nandini is my colleague who works with me in um, CNS. What you see here is an interesting thing. If you treat these patients, they do benefit. But whether you treat with radiation, surgery, or chemo, it seems that more or less they are similar. And this was one of the first time this data went down, which could, you could say confidently in relapsed gliomas, systemic therapy, re-radiation, or re-surgery nearly have the same outcomes. We can't go away without bevacizumab uh, in gliomas. And this was the data of first data which came from India on bevacizumab. A lot of this work was done by Monica Bopanna, which showed that yeah, bevacizumab had similar pattern of benefit as is seen in international studies. But the interesting thing was this. This is actually a cutest plot. The area which I've shared in red is the time which the patients spent with toxicities. You could see that most of the patients on bevacizumab actually have a good quality of life when this data uh, came out. But the question was, we started getting biosimilars, and biosimilars were a lot cheaper. And hence, we did this propensity match analysis to see whether, as opposed to innovator, whether you used a biosimilar, whether the outcomes were similar or not. Again, Gunjesh, Hollis, and Anu worked a lot on this project, and we actually did show that, yes, they had similar efficacies. The next question was, Dr. Rakesh Jain's hypothesis suggests that giving low doses of bevacizumab may be better than high dose. In fact, high doses of bevacizumab had a negative study in presence of CCNU versus CCNU plus high dose of bev was a negative study. And we always thought that a low dose of bevacizumab actually normalizes the channel. A high dose of bevacizumab actually blocks the channel. So giving a low dose might be beneficial. And this was a hypothesis generating study in which we had given low doses of bevacizumab around one milligram per kg, and it actually showed that it had, seems to be having slightly better outcomes than uh, that of full dose of bevacizumab. Now, we all would agree as medical oncologists, we need prospective studies, and this is a study called Vamana, taking inspiration from the Vaman lot, he could grow in size, that low dose of bevacizumab actually in body would grow in size, and might give us better outcomes. And this is a, a recruiting study, around 30% of recruitment has been done on this study. But the good thing is that you don't forget CCNU and temozolomide. In selected patients, in residual gliomas, when you give CCNU, you get excellent outcomes. Two students, Dr. Rai Stonesen and Dr. Ram Abino, actually worked hard on this. Selected patient, you can actually do re-challenge of temozolomide also. Also gives good outcomes. What I mean by selected? Two years or more of DF5 uh, in these patients. But the question was, could you do some repurposing in gliomas because it had a very bad outcomes? Mevendazole came as an answer. Mevendazole 
had anti-glioma properties. There are three versions of mebendazole, A, B, and C, but we would call that polymorph. C is not available in India, but it has the best CNS penetration, around 70% of its penetration. So there was a drug which was out of patent, it was cheap, it had anti-glioma properties, and it could penetrate the brain. What more you needed? You needed a study to, s to define whether you could combine it with CCN, you combine with Timozolum, and combine with RT, uh, uh, Timozolumide. We actually were racing here with the COG group and the Harvard group because simul COG and Harvard started this study three years earlier to this. And we started the study after three years. And I, I was really happy with the way our whole DMG worked. We actually bet beat the both COG and Harvard group in publishing the first results of the phase one study of repurposing mebendazole and getting the maximum tolerable dose of mebendazole along with CCNU, along with Timozolamide, along with RT and Timozolamide, all separate and had different MTD in each of them. The question was whether it would help or not. And this was a poster presentation which was done by Dr. Nandini this year in ASCO in which we actually uh, went ahead and uh, completed the phase two study and presented the results. The study overall came negative, and the reason for that was we enrolled even PS2 and PS3 patients, and our assumptions were based on PS0 and 1 patients. So there is a subgroup analysis which suggests that this might be beneficial. Obviously, this needs more hypothesis testing. This actually got published in e-clinical e medicine, which has an impact factor of 20 nearly. And with that, we have actually started now the first phase three multicentric study of CCNU mebendazole versus CCNU with a gold standard primary endpoint as overall survival. My colleague, Dr. Srinivas from PGI MER Chandigarh will be the lead PI in the study and it has already got approved from PGI Chandigarh. And PGI AIMS, Tata, Malabar Cancer Center and two centers from Nepal are trying to collaborate in this project. A lot of other studies did happen in uh, CNS. We looked at the financial toxicities. We looked at the anti-emetic prophylaxis. We looked at the, this was a new OPD to be started with. I do audit my practice, looking at the satisfaction rates of these patients with the OPD and looking at the distress rates of uh, this OPD. Mridul was central to all of these studies. And in most of the CNS studies, we I didn't have quarantine to start with. Actually, most of the, my students know that when I initially I went, I even didn't have a chamber. I had to uh, start the OPD standing in a, in the corridor of the CNS area. It took uh, three years for me to get an allotted chamber. And if it wouldn't have been for this dedicated residence, this won't have been possible. How did we did something in curative? And I'll show you something in curative. And these are all the ladies who are our MSc students and all of them were posted with me at some point or the other for three months, four months, and they were the greatest boon to my research because they were the one who methodically maintained the files, took consent, follow-up of the patient was done, and actually the lady here, Dr. Uh, Ocean, she was a nurse, the long photo, oh, she was the first one to do, and she act, and each of them actually have a first author publication in CNS while the posting of around six months which they were there with us. We all know the results of RTOG 9802. PCV did show that it was better. But community practice is Timozolomide. This is top study. Head-to-head -head comparison of Timozolomide versus PCV. This, there are only two studies going on globally. One has been done by URTC, which is recruiting very slowly, about 36 patients have got recruited. We need 217 patients. One not one, oh, one patient got recruited yesterday. So we are, if everything goes according to plan, in another 15 years, because this would require a large amount of follow-up for the events to happen, you would get these results. But I'm not going to show you the results. What I'm going to show you is, if you give PCB properly, and this manuscript is under a review properly, can it be given? The RTOG guy could give it only for three cycles of fluorocarbazine and median four cycles of month. If you have a good plan, neuromedical oncologists giving this regimen, you could see that in Tata we could deliver 5.5, the maximum number is six, and five, six in CCNU and Winchrist in 5.5. The moral of the story is, if you put heart in giving PCV, this can be deliverable even in Indian settings. For last minute, I'll show you some interesting studies which are going on in CNS. Uh, we are trying to repurpose Jamsitabin to see whether it could help in meningioma. Satvik did the initial work of this. This was a fantastic study which was conceptualized and uh, Chandrakant is here, he was there and Siddharth was there when this was conceptualized. This was conceptualized pre-COVID 
And the reason why this got conceptualized was because patients of CNS had difficulty coming to agent. This was a head-to-head -head randomized study to check whether clinical follow-up could be replaced by video follow-up. And yes, the study was decisively showed that video don't need clinical follow-up. Video follow-up, whichever way you see it, was better than that. Patients were more satisfied with this, the decisions were similar, and there was a lot of cost cutting which happened, which you could see that the cost of clinical follow-up came out around 131 US dollars, and it came down to 58 uh, US dollars if you could go for, with this. this. This whole topic was about CNS and adrenal cancer. But my ho I couldn't disappoint my host, Dr. Vivek. And this is slide for Vivek, because this was the phase three study which Vivek presented in ASCO of 2018, of Pemetrexid versus Arlotimazan maintenance. In it. I need to thank a lot of funders, uh, without which none of the studies can be done. I'm very grateful to Terry Fox Foundation, which repeatedly year and after year finds me credible to give me funding. I need to thank a lot of uh, uh, other things like TRAC, Brain Tumor Foundation of India, CRST Foundation, Motition Excellence, ICON. ICON has actually sponsored two to three studies of mine. This wouldn't have been if I didn't have great teachers and mentors like Kumar Prabhash sir, Vanita Narona madam, and Amit Joshi sir, and a whole lot of coordinators like Viji, uh, Kavita, Shushti who work hard with us, and a whole lot of residents. I have shown you some snapshot of residents. This is routine during ASCO. Sujit is there, Kunjesh is there. They won't get leaves when ASCO is near. You need to do data entry, you need to do analysis, and you need to send papers. And this is the culture we have generated. This is one man many of you would have seen in 108. He, he is Dr. Sachin Dumali, he was a study coordinator. Unfortunately, we couldn't retain him, and he has gone to ATRAC. He knows head and neck cancers, palliative treatment, as par with Varmakon, I would say, because he has been part of all the studies, knows everything about racist, everything about toxicity assessment. I need to thank my neuro DMG, especially Professor Jalali. It's very rare that you have someone coming from outside coming to the Department of Neuro, you are giving him space in medical oncology, and within five to six years, you could see randomized study data coming on. This is not possible without the cooperation of many. I need to thank my colleagues from Malabar Cancer Center because a lot of work was inspired at Malabar Cancer. Sujit is sitting there. Sujit has been with me in Malabar. Sujit has been with me. And definitely, I would have missed some. And that's the reason why I made this slide yesterday. This is the slide of 185 students who had worked with me, and I need to thank each one of them. This wouldn't have been possible without each one of them actually spending their personal lifetime to work with us. I need to thank, there are multiple people here, and I'm sorry if I would have missed someone, uh, but these are all the students, and the last row is special. This is Dr. Prasad, Dr. Bharat. The data we have this culture. I was never a junior because they had left already before them. But every conference I visit, Every time I visit them, it was, in fact, it was Bharat's thesis. That was the first paper I wrote in Tata, and it was really a Shubhmurt. Today, I have around 550, 570 publications, and that was really a good, uh, what you could say, Nariel to start with. I always find this that our Tata seniors are very encouraging. They ask what studies are going on, they are interested in doing, and this is a very phenomenal culture which is there in Tata. I need to thank a lot of lab partners, Dr. Atanu, Dr. Shantam, who has been my teacher, my friend, and my guide, and above all, never acknowledge my wife, and I need to acknowledge her. All the research in India comes at the cost of personal time from five to 10. And it, if it wasn't for her, I couldn't have done it. Thank you. Please come here. Uh, so can we request Vivek sir and Chandra Khan sir as well? Yes. Vivek and Chandra Khan, please hand over the oration clock to uh, Vijay. Big 
Thank you.